Medications for Opioid Use Disorders in Correctional Settings, Shifting the Paradigm, Creating a Balanced Correctional and Rehabilitative Approach. The Opioid Response Network is funded by SAMHSA to provide resources and technical assistance needed locally to address the opioid crisis. This video is part of a series to provide guidance on the implementation of medications for opioid use disorder in correctional facilities. Leading corrections and behavioral health experts present information on topics such as the use of medication, models of delivery, diversion, and linkages to care and community support. Brent Gibson and Barry Weiner discuss achieving buy-in. Well, thank you. My name is Brent Gibson. I'm the Chief Health Officer for NCCHC, and then I also work uh, with NCCHC Resources, which is basically our consulting subsidiary uh, where I, I work as Managing Director. I'm an occupational medicine physician by training and did my time in the Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, in Springfield, Missouri, if any of you are familiar with that uh, system. So the, you, you are the uh, corrections officer group, is that correct? I'm gonna make sure I understand. Okay, perfect. So is everyone a line CO here or a supervisor? No, okay. Just real briefly, uh, do we have um, like captains and lieutenants or? Okay, okay. and uh, any uh, majors or, or above, that, uh, deputy wardens, that type? Okay, okay, wonderful. Well, I appreciate you being here. It's a small group, so yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, good. We have we have a loyal following of clinicians following us from room to room. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Did everybody figure out the matrix for the classes? It took me two days to figure out where I was supposed to be and when. But I'm glad I'm in the right place. And uh, I I've done. Uh, I really appreciate the conference planning. I've done this kind of thing before. It's very challenging to have useful material for everybody and to break it up in the room. So the guys have done a great. Oren's just done a great job. We're so grateful. Um, and other than the escalator being out and having no visibility across the lobby, everything is fine. But, you know, we appreciate you all being here. The fact that you're here at this conference, I think, gives us a great starting point because you're interested in what we're doing and maybe hearing a little bit of the clinical side. This uh, section is about achieving buy-in, but usually it's us who are coming to you <laughs> and trying to get some buy-in. But if you can be ambassadors, if you will, if you're, if you're believers in this program and what we're doing, that'll really help and make our jobs a lot easier. So uh, I have a few slides available just so it has information for you to kind of take home and look at. There's a very large deck, but I think when you have time away from the conference, you can look at the material and it can be a useful reference. But we're gonna to touch on a couple of parts here. It's a little different material than we just presented to the clinicians. And then Barry from Rhode Island will give you a lot of really incredible experience as a frontline person. Um, we've already, I would let uh, Barry talk about real world experience here and I'll offer just a little bit from the accreditation perspective because that's a lot of what we do is we uh, bring the accreditation that you will need if you want to start a program in your, in your facility. Are any of you the actual decision makers on whether you move forward with me? You are, okay. So this, come sit right here. No. Um, this is a pretty big decision you're making uh, to bring this program in. And one of the components, one of the first things you have to think about is what model do you want to use? You've heard a lot of that throughout the conference about three or possibly four models. And all of them can work, but all of them are different. Where we are most experienced at NCCHC is those programs that you start yourself in the jail to serve your population. That's different than you go to the outside to bring in a program. Uh, and even that has different sub forms, which you've heard a little bit about. But there are a number of jails, it's a small number, but there are a number of jails who they are the MAT. They're not affiliated with anybody, they do it. Uh, and we really admire that. And keep in mind, in the communities, Methadone clinics are really not as common as you might think. If you have a, if you grow, if you're in a, a eastern major city or anywhere here on the eastern seaboard, you kind of take for granted the presence of community resources. It is just not the way it looks across the country. We have entire states where there are no opioid programs, and many others where they are hours and hours apart from the nearest, you know, the population centers. Even in places that are sort of stereotypically politically progressive. They're not progressive at all in this area. <laughs> they're, just, they're just not. So that's something to keep in mind. Opiate deaths, opioid deaths are a real problem. And I would admit freely that we physicians are part of the problem. We over-prescribed pain medications. We were kind of beaten down in training 
to make sure that people didn't have pain, if you will. And so what's the quickest way to get rid of pain? Well, you prescribe an opioid. And for those with a little bit of pharmaceutical knowledge, it doesn't make the pain go away. You just kind of stop bother. It stops bothering you. <laughs> you know, yeah, my foot has been cut off, but I'm okay with that. Uh, it's very different than anti-inflammatories, which actually treat the physiologic happenings behind inflammation and pain. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's kind of one thing is it tricks the brain, if you will. And you got some really good lectures earlier on on this. But the deaths are a real problem. And a lot of these, I should say, kind of anecdotally are occurring in jails. I'm going to real quickly go through this material. It's this annoyingly animated slide. I apologize. But it's tracing the timeline and all the various people and parts and agencies that are involved in this, which can be a little bit intimidating. Uh, there are uh, a lot, there's a lot of activity, a lot of money being spent, and it's not always as coordinated as it as it uh, could be. And one of the things that's great about this conference is we're bringing everybody together. So I think that's really a big step. So we'll go past this. The correctional environment of care. I think this stuff will be more interesting for your group. So I hope it. I hope it makes. I hope it's very. Uh, I hope this section is pretty useful. It's not just jails. It's also prisons home arrest, probation, and parole. These are all, if you will, environments of care. And that's how we look at correctional health care, is we want care, it's, it's a practice environment. Just like if I practice in a hospital versus a clinic versus another country versus in the military, these are all environments of care. But to the extent possible, you want the care to follow basic, you want to have basic quality aspects to it. And that's where I think you really, are challenged as leaders on the correction side is, you know very well that you're not like every other place in the community, and somehow you're being held to these standards. But at the same time, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you can figure out how to do it. You can really provide a service. I would encourage all of you to think about a jail or a prison as a critical link in the public health infrastructure. Because you are. I mean, you are providing health services. Maybe that's not what you wanted to do. Uh, drug courts, too, excuse me. But this is, it's, it, in our country, we have a constitutional right to health care. We say this sometimes, but it's really the one of few or perhaps the only population that is constitutionally entitled to health care. And in jails, it's uh, 14th Amendment due process violations. If there's, you know, prob if it's not done right, and in prisons, it's cruel and unusual punishment. Eighth Amendment. But nobody really tells you what does that mean. What is what is what is the basic thing I need to do? You know, is it first aid? Do I need to offer a, you know, an operating suite in my jail or prison? And and all that stuff has been tried. We try to help bridge the gap between what you're supposed to do and where you are on the ground by writing the standards, and that includes standards for MAT which we'll talk about today. Um, one just kind of annoying thing is the Inmate Exclusion Act in 1964. This is what drives all of your budgets higher. You can't get access to federal dollars. As you've heard probably many times during this conference with the Medicaid expansion, many of your patients, your inmates, are eligible for reimbursement. Were they not in jail or prison? They are poor. Uh, they are. It's not just for uh, women, children, and those with chronic renal failure. It's really many indigent men in particular, which is your population, that you, but you can't get those federal dollars. We're working to change this in Washington. It's, it's a long haul. Here's some areas to think about, again, where it is that you will sort of uh, where it is that m that medical care comes on your radar. It's kind of these touch points, if you will. And any one of them is where you can potentially ha identify the patients you want to treat. Um, see if any of this, uh, I hope this sounds kind of familiar. There's limited knowledge about the science of addiction, not addition. Maybe there's limited knowledge of that too. Uh, but <laughs> addiction and OTPs. It's just not, even uh, medical folks don't always understand the details of it. I mean, we have to study a lot of stuff in medical school, and we can't get into any depth in any one area. And it's really only the last few decades that addiction medicine and science has really come really far to where we now have board certification in this area. Um, uh, historic attitudes, dr drug substitution. People will say, well, why are you treating one, you know, you're trying to get them off drugs, but you're giving them a drug to get there. That doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? And there are people that still have this attitude of, well, you know, this dummy got himself in the situation. You know, a little tough love is going to straighten him or her out. Let them go through withdrawal a couple times, and they won't do it again. But it doesn't work, right? Addictions don't work that way, right? How, people get DUIs over and over and over again because the alcohol is driving their decision making. Right? It's, and the same thing is true here. You can withdraw until you die. When you die, then it's over. But until that point, you're going to go back and use again unless you're being treated, more than likely. 
Diversion is a real risk, but sometimes the perceived risk is, is also there. In other words, diversion is a part of inmate culture, right? That's what you do. You have all day to think about ways to get around the system. But patients, inmates divert everything. They divert all kinds of non-controlled substances, uh, albuterol inhalers, medicines for asthma. Gabapentin is like diverted all the time and misused, even though it's, a, you know, it's not thought of as a drug that's really particularly addictive. So just, I would say, avoid the boogeyman, meaning think, try to assess that diversion risk logically and coolly and make decisions on what is happening, not what might happen. You know, don't joust the hypothetical, if you will. Well, this could happen, therefore I'm not going to do it well. Um, you know, you heard about the injectable buprenorphine, Dr. Um, uh, uh, I can't remember who, if it was Dr. Clark or someone else talked about it. That's like f possible physically, but how many times does it really happen? I don't have any idea, probably not very many. So that's something to think about. Uh, cost and time involved in obtaining an OTP license, that can be real or that can be managed. Uh, it can be really expensive or you can find funding to do it. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, uh, this is a really sad number. <laughs> it, it, makes me, it makes me sad that we have a handful of jails and prisons that are doing this. This data is a couple years old, but I don't think the numbers are going to be like strikingly different, orders of magnitude different. So imagine if 30 out of 5,000 hospitals had an emergency room, right? You'd be like, well, that's, a, you know, that's bad. I don't, you know, we need to change something. So the things are, are not being offered as they should. Only half of people who get all the way to drug court, the specialized system designed for people with addiction problems, half of them participate with MAT because the judges themselves may not, and the prosecutors and others involved may not have the information that they need or may not believe in this program. Upon reentry, 45% of state and federal prisoners uh, are, re uh, are referred inmates, so again, less than half. I just had some federal folks talking to me and they're trying to change things from the top down, but top down change is hard. You can order someone to do something, but then you have to do it, right? And we don't have always the kind of military systems that maybe some of us are used to where you have an entire chain of command and everybody to do everything. You don't always have that. You don't have an instant MAT implementation team. Are you gonna like task another part of your folks to do that? Probably not. Are you gonna pull people off the CERT team and pull people out of this clinic or borrow from the next jail? I don't know, you know, it's not, it's, it's a big ask. But this is real, and, and some of the presenters have touched on this. This is a substantial uh, statistic. You heard about sort of the reverse of this, which is when we treat common chronic diseases like high cholesterol, we see a little clinical effect, you know, 5% reduction in mortality or whatever it was. So we're excited about that. Most of us are willing to accept that reduction. Um, uh, but we don't, uh, the effect of good MAT is so many more times potent, and the effect of not happening it is, is just striking. So, I mean, this is the data. It's not made up. This stuff really does work when it's done right. All right, I want to be mindful of the time and be sure that uh, Barry has time to talk. How late do we go, Barry? What time? It's now 2.45. How much time do we have? So we do have a little more time. Okay, well, I don't, I, I want to, there's just so much material here and trying to get you the key stuff is, is challenging. Um, here's some things to think about that might be useful for you as you're achieving buy-in from your leadership. There is, it can be, um, it's helpful to be able to articulate to them the differences and the similarities between community programs and what you're proposing to do, even if you're bringing the community program in. Uh, okay, community-based OTPs often focus on long-term treatment. But in your case, and this is more for jails than prisons, it's more short, short term. But you do have people cycling in and out. So if you have good continuity of care with the community, you're basically getting the same thing in different environments, and that can be good. Again, skepticism towards the disease model of addiction. I go again with addiction. This is excellent. Uh, Got to get that editor. Uh, it's not diabetes, Doc. It's true, but it is, has some things similar. We talked, Barry gave a great example in the last talk about when he was implementing, and I don't want to steal his thunder, but people wanted to be sure that there were repercussions for not following the rules of the program. You know, punishment. There's that punishment attitude. This is healthcare. We don't punish people for eating donuts when they're diabetic. We don't. We don't take away their insulin, do we? You wouldn't, I mean, if I, if I don't exercise three times a week, what if my doc cut off my blood pressure medicine? it would be like, you're a jerk, you know? I mean, so think about it like that. It's not a favor we're doing for patients by treating them, right? It's we are trying to get them better because we want them out of the jails and prisons and 
stopping, you know, holding up the 7-Eleven to get the money to buy the drugs or abusing their families, whatever it is, we need to treat this disease. Um, uh, and again, methadone in particular has kind of a bad reputation. There's a lot of shoddy community programs out there, especially in the past, so it has a bad reputation. It takes like 10 years to get a good reputation and one day to get a bad reputation, and we have some of that going on with methadone. Uh, there's some payment issues as well that are probably beyond our, our scope here. But some are some similarities. This is, again, you're part of the public health system. You are serving, in many ways, the same marginalized lower-income populations. You're taking care of the folks that have committed crimes, and the community is taking care of those who have avoided that. They are not necessarily morally or ethically different people. They're just on opposite sides of the law. Uh, we've all broken the law, every one of us at one point or another. Uh, you're isolated a little bit from community health care. What I mean is you don't go to see your doctor's office to get your primary care visit, and next door, a part of that office is the methadone clinic, right? They're kind of like somewhere else. And I hear doctors to this day say things like, I don't want to take care of those patients, right? Your communities aren't always going to want to have a methadone clinic there because it, 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 it uh, you know, potentially attracts uh, folks with, with challenges and issues that you, you know, maybe you, or you just don't want to see it. I don't know. There is uh, a, a kind of a bad exchange of information, both in the community and in the jail, in terms of healthcare. Not bad, but clunky. Healthcare information is always not uh, per, not uh, flowing the way it should. And uh, there's also problems with some of the pharmacy programs at the state level and how to participate. Uh, high levels of structure, including observation and dosing, that is a similarity. Uh, so we're going to shift now to talk a little bit about sort of options for continuation of partnerships. And these are some things for you to think about as leaders as you work to achieve buy-in. Exchange of dosing information, weakened bridging of methadone. This is really an issue in jails, probably less so in prisons. But you have, you have a real problem over the weekend, and that's when a lot of people show up. Uh, but the community resources are not available. So you have to figure out how to provide services during that 72-hour period. We, again, I've heard about this transport of patients from facility to OTP is one kind of option, or the other way around, gas doses from the OTP to the facility. Uh, so, but that's not that you're going to run out of gas at that option at some point. You need to figure out a long-term solution. Um, you can, again, reach the community in the facility, or have a mobile unit uh, come to the facility. All different opportunities for you. A satellite OTP is not what I was talking about earlier. I'm talking about this is there's an established program like Kodak, and this is uh, that inf those uh, programs can reach inside uh, the facilities. And your jail OTP with coordination of care is another option. All right. So, uh, what can OTPs? We're speaking about the community. What can they offer you in the corrections? We talked about this guest dosing and prescribing. Method of, guest dosing is a weird term, and it refers to the fact that, again, this medication is not treated like anyone else. You have to be in a regulated program to uh, have this medication. So it's called guest dosing when it gets to the inside for patients who are not up, enrolled in the community program. Withdrawal management, now this is a sticky area. I would just give you one take-home point, and that is that withdrawal is not treatment, right? Sometimes when you're treating patients, they go through withdrawal, but that's not the same thing as treatment. So you'll find the situation where these medicines are used to blunt withdrawal symptoms. That's like a component of treatment, but that is not treatment itself. And some of the reason people, doctors especially, hedge in this area is because you can't treat opioid disorders with another opiate, opioid unless you're a licensed OTP. So we find all kinds of weird workarounds. Uh, and one of them is that you say basically you're treating withdrawal symptoms. But again, you may get through that acute period even using an agonist, but then what do you do, right? You're through the three days or four days. If you don't have a system for helping with the cravings and so forth, you're going to be right back where you started. Um, uh, diagnosis and initiation, again, and reach, as we've talked about. Uh, so these are all resources that your community can help you with, counseling and case management and pre-release care coordination. All right. Um, benefits to you, access to MAT saves lives, reduces disciplinary problems, improves or re-engage uh, treatment for people in the community, and honestly, reducing recidivism and community crime. These are all real things. Your medical legal risk is very significant in this area, and by having a program, you're going to reduce that risk. And 
pregnancy is its whole other uh, whole other ball of wax that you want to uh, be aware of. These patients require very specific treatment, and there's plenty of case law accumulating that says that you need to provide this service, and you can be a part of the community solution. How do you benefit the community as well? Again, same sort of thing that we talked about, but on the community side, creating opportunities with law enforcement and community corrections, and improving care. And there's potentially a window for federal funding. Uh, since in the interest of time, so we also have questions, I'm going to let uh, uh, Barry take over. But these things are all available to you in the slide deck, and uh, we'll be here for questions as well. OK. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. I'm going to do something that's going to freak you out. I'm going to put that over that. So how about we take a 15-minute break from PowerPoints, right? Because you know that death by PowerPoint thing? We've seen a lot over the last few days, a lot of great information. Uh, but my training is as a social worker. So I like just kind of chatting and talking to people. So let's go back to the old style. You know what these are? Remember these index cards? And even when you went to school, before you had PowerPoint, you had these things and you wrote some notes. So I wrote some notes on here that I wanted to share. Reminds me of a cartoon I saw recently. Uh, it was a young boy in his grandmother's home. And the grandmother uh, was on the phone. She had the phone on the wall, you know, one of those dial phones where you do this. And it had the handle and the long cord. And the son went home and went to his mom and said, Mom, Grandma got this great new invention. It's a phone, and it has a cord on it so you don't lose it. Isn't this a great idea? So we go back to, to, to the old way. Uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, about buy-in, uh, not what the books say, but just what I learned from three decades as being a manager in different places talk about some issues that I've seen with security clinicians and administrators, and then finally end just talking about some of the problems and issues that we had uh, in, in Rhode Island. I have a real affinity for security staff. My first internship was at Rikers Island Jail. Uh, back, it was 1978, actually. Uh, so it was a long time ago. And then most of my career was in community corrections, but I did have the opportunity to work uh, at Lewisburg, uh, the federal penitentiary uh, and the boot camp there. We had a leadership development program through the federal judicial center. So I did a couple of weeks where I actually served time there. And the boot camp I thought was pretty cool. I thought it did a great job until some researcher wrote some research on it and found out it doesn't work. That six months later, people returned to their old ways. So as you probably know, they closed down the boot camp. And I guess boot camps are not a, a, a popular thing uh, nowadays. So I think when we talk about buy-in, uh, it's all about relationships, right? People will work hard and do a good job for people they trust uh, and people they like and people they respect. So the first thing as a manager, as a leader, now some of you might be line officers, and I know you're all at different levels, a couple of clinicians, but I think this is relevant whether you're a leader now, a formal leader or an informal leader, or if you're not one now, Maybe you will be one in the future. Uh, what does a good leader look like who can get buy-in from his staff, someone that people want to work with? So I kind of wrote down uh, a couple of, 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 of points. And the first is show staff that you value and appreciate their work. A lot of people think if you say, what motivates somebody? You're going to say money, right? Give me a raise. Give me a raise, and I'll do a better job. Well, we found that that's not really true. Uh, People are motivated when they know that what they're doing is important, it's valued, and it's appreciated. So if you want buy-in, make sure as a leader you constantly give feedback to your people, letting them know that's the case. Empower staff to make decisions and make them responsible for those decisions. Sometimes as mid-level managers, we want to dictate to people you know, how to do things. And that's the paramilitary way, right? To do A, B, C, D, E. But when we're talking about program development, you really have to rely on the people who know the work, the staff who's in the building. So empower them. Let them know what the vision is. Let them know what the mission is. And let them figure it out the best. We found the assistant directors and the wardens, they really didn't know the best way to run a med line but the lieutenant did, and the correction officers on the line did. So listen to them. Let them have a say. Catch staff doing things right. There was a book I read many years ago. Some of you may have heard of it, The One Minute Manager. 
And you know, we spend so much time, right, looking at people and writing them up for things they do wrong. How much time do we spend catching pe people doing things right and then letting them know that we caught them doing things right? When you do that, it's amazing the buy-in, the credibility, uh, how hard people will work for you. Uh, take an interest in your staff. One thing when I started working in the prison, uh, I took time uh, to sit and spend a couple of hours with a counselor inside. And everybody was amazed. Like, why is he spending time? I, like, the counselors are kind of low down on the totem pole. And that counselor and all the counselors, the whole unit appreciated it so much that an administrator would take an interest in the work they did. Uh, it really gave credibility to me, to the program, uh, and let them want to work harder for me. Uh, you know, cross-training, and many of you are in security. One of the things we learned in Rhode Island, that the more things we could do together between security and rehab, the better we work as a team. So years ago, before I got there, I understand there was leadership. It was almost like a divided house. Uh, security competed against rehab. You competed for resources. You competed for all sorts of things, and there were constant battles. I'm very fortunate now we have a great director. We have a great assistant director in charge of institutions and operations. And his philosophy is, no, Barry, you don't have a problem. We have a problem. Or I don't have a problem. We have a problem. So one thing we did to, I think, promote buy-in and get people to work together is did things together. We have probation officers now that come into the facilities and spend the day with a lieutenant. We have lieutenants that go and spend days with probation officers. Uh, I spent a day with a, our special investigations unit officer because they do things that I'm not really involved in. Well, it was a great day, and we learned that we have a common interest. We both like muscle cars. We both have Mustangs. So this was about a year ago, and to this day, we've become buddies. We share things. We share articles about the new Mustang GT500. And he shared with you know, his team, the security people, like, hey, Barry's not a bad guy. You know, he's in rehab, but he's really a pretty good guy. Uh, and I share with them, like, this guy, you know, he's from SIU, but he's like really a, a cool guy. So I think those relationships go a long way. Work, 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 work to build them. Uh, as a manager, ask people what they need from you to do their jobs better. Because I think as leaders, managers, that's a big part of what we do. We help people get the job done. And the only way to know what people need uh, is to ask them. You may or may not be able to provide it, but the fact that you ask them, people will, will, will appreciate. Uh, articulate clearly that your job is to help them succeed. And that's certainly what my job is. Like with MAT, I have Dr. Clark, and with other programs, I have a principal who runs the school, and we have someone who runs classification. But my job is to make sure folks have the tools to succeed and do whatever I can, because I have access to the director, uh, to financial resources, to the governor, some things that, that they don't have. Uh, food. I can't talk about leadership without mentioning food. Now, again, this works for me. It may not work for everybody. But my wife is a really good cook, and she loves to bake. So somehow I've learned, for me, that when I have a meeting of a small group of people, if there's some eggs present, it just lightens the discussion and makes for fun, and people uh, seem to do better. I also keep a big candy dish uh, in my office. And I have the good stuff, those like little Nestle's bite things, and people love them. So my office just happens to be in the administration building where we have a big conference room where there are meetings going on cons uh, constantly. So when the wardens or deputy wardens have a meeting, they have to walk by my office. And oftentimes, and usually after the meeting, they'll stop and, hey, Barry, you mind if I take a candy? Well, that gives me an opportunity to chat with them. Hey, how's it going? What's going on? Just build those informal relationships. Uh, and the food uh, really helped. Uh, and the last thing I'll say on this before moving on, again, there's a lot more, but in the interest of time, I just want to think about things you could, you could do for your staff to get them to trust, appreciate, and work hard for you. Uh, and the last one, I've always asked my managers, my direct reports, let me know when someone on your team does something really well, something that they excel at. 
do that service for me, and then what I do is I take that information and I share it with the person. Like, hey, I learned you really went out of your way today and you did this or you did that. And sometimes I'll even share the messages with the director or other members of the executive team. People like to feel appreciated and people work hard when they know they are appreciated. So four steps quickly to ensure buy-in for MAT. Uh, if you're responsible for staffing the med lines, the program, make sure you staff it appropriately because officers, and again, some of you are in that role, maybe you're the MAT officer, you don't want to be beat, right? You don't want inmates to beat you, and if they do beat you and nothing happens to it, you're going to get frustrated. So make sure with good staffing and adequate staffing, it helps really avoid a lot of the problems, a lot of diversion, and other things uh, that happen. Training and, and education from the outset. Train about NEO to new correction officers, to new, to new clinical people. At your new employee orientation, we call it NEO. Or when they first get in, don't wait uh, down the road till they develop all these myths and untruths uh, about the program. Prepare people for setbacks. We've talked a little bit about this before. Not everybody is going to succeed on MAT. Some people are going to revert to drug usage. And then folks might feel, a new officer might feel, you see, this program is a waste of time. They're using it again. It's going to happen. It's not going to be 100% successful. No medical intervention is going to be. So prepare for that. Or if someone leaves to go home, and then they return back X months later, convicted of a new crime. You see, once again, it didn't work. Well, interestingly, sometimes uh, people commit crimes for different reasons, right? The clinicians know criminogenic needs the eight major crimes. So, so everybody's different. For some people, because of their addiction and their use of drugs, the need for money, they commit crimes to get the money. For other people, they commit crimes for other reasons. So they could still be sober and on MAT, but still commit crimes. Sometimes we say you have a sober criminal. So just because you're not using drugs and you're on MAT doesn't mean you're not going to commit new, new, new crimes. Uh, so some points for security. We just spoke to clinicians, uh, Dr. Gibson and I, and heard things from their perspective. One thing I would ask you, uh, and ask our folks, please understand clinicians, for the most part, don't have the security training and experience that you all have and have grown up with. They do things that frustrate you, I bet, uh, and they do things that you think jeopardize the security of the building and is a tendency to get annoyed with them. Uh, but please understand that, for the most part, they're not doing it purposely. They just never had had training. They just don't really understand. And a way you can be helpful is by taking some of these people under your wing. And when you see something, uh, explaining it to them. Let them know what they're doing that doesn't make sense. Uh, it was interesting talking to L Lieutenant Bray, one of our lieutenants, uh, who spoke uh, the first day. Uh, you know, when, when many of our clinicians see a med line, they think, medicine, help people, restore lives, make them better. Well, when the lieutenant sees a med line, what she thinks, I've got valuables here. I've got a dangerous product. If these inmates overcome me and take control of this, there's going to be a lot of trouble. Kind of like someone with a stack full of $100 bills with a group of bank robbers around them. So it's a whole different lens that you're seeing the world with. But again, we need that world. But understand that clinicians may not have that uh, experience, so give them a break. Uh, many of our clinicians are, are young females, probably 30 years old or less. I don't know if that's you know, the experience that you have. Uh, but don't yell at them. <laughs> don't scream at them. Uh, they don't often take it well. You know, They get frustrated. If you have a problem with them, uh, Bring it to a supervisor. Let the supervisor handle it. You're smiling. I mean, we had an incident where a correction officer had some fun with you know, a nice, young, new clinician. Uh, we had a, a, an inmate who was very ill with a lot of medical complications uh, and was also on MAT. Well, the patient ultimately died 
of medical complications. But the officer went to the clinician, see your MAT program? You, you killed him. Uh, now, the officer was having fun. You know, it's, it's humor, it's prison humor, right? The, but that clinician took it really seriously and it took a while to work through the issue with her because she was just so, 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 so traumatized. So again, this prison humor, it's the way you guys get through the day, we understand it. But please understand that some of these folks, uh, they don't get it, they don't live, uh, they don't live that, that experience. Um, for Clint, jail, it, I mean, it's a different culture, jail, right? It was different for me coming from the inside, from the outside. It's just different. And understand people don't always get it. Now, as the assistant director in charge of rehab, I agree, security and safety are the number one things. And I understand, uh, and it happens to us frequently, because of lack of staffing and involuntary mandatory overtime. Uh, we can't always run the programs we have scheduled. So we have clinicians come in sometimes to do their program, and they're told, sorry, not today. We don't have staffing. We're closing the education building. We're not doing the anger management program. So I get that. I understand that, I agree with that, but not all the clinical staff always understand that, uh, and they think, well, that's, that's, that's not right. I'm here to, you know, to change people, to save people. So we need to do, an, again, an education uh, of clinicians about the, and others about the importance of safety and security, and we train them that they have to understand that these things are gonna happen. That's what happens in a prison, and you have to learn to accept it. And if you can't accept it, you're not gonna succeed uh, in, in, in a prison environment. You have to have tough skin, you have to have emotional maturity, uh, and that relationships with correction officers take time. A lot of times someone new comes in and they see you, they wanna be your friend, and you're, you know, you have the eyes of, I don't know this person, let me, you know, get to know. So we tell clinicians, you know, take it slow, try to build relationships, but it takes time, it doesn't uh, happen overnight, and we tell them the same thing that I'm sure your superiors tell you or you tell your staff, try not to take the job home with you. It's a really hard job that you folks do. Uh, and it really pays a toll, uh, and it's hard not to take it home, but it's important to, to do that. So some errors that we made in introducing our MAT program. For us, it happened real fast. We didn't have the experience of other states. Our governor said we're going to have MAT in the state. We're going to bring it in the prison. They went to Dr. Clark. Uh, they said put together a budget. Amazing as she is, it took about 10 minutes. She came up with a $2 million budget, which is exactly how much uh, we spent. And three months later, we were actually operating the program. So we were still building the ship uh, as we were functioning. The right way to do it really is to do all the preparation before you start the program, and you'll avoid and miss a lot of the other problems that we experienced. The education, it just came too late. We were already running the program, and all these misnomers and rumors were going around. So we did the education, uh, but it hurt us because we did it late. Things like you're hearing here today, the publications, uh, et cetera. We introduced it as a medical program. In retrospect, we should have introduced it as a joint medical and security program together with both parts equally responsible because both parts do play an important role and it's not gonna work if both sides aren't on, on board. Don't say things, we said things to appease security because we respected security. So one of the officers, Dr. Giff, uh, Gibson referenced this. It's like, all right, we'll take this program, but if they divert, you're gonna throw them out of the program, right? He said, yes, that's what we'll do. Well, that's not what we did, and that's not really good practice, but it was just our effort to wanna get this in, and we lost credibility because we did that. You, know, you said you were gonna do this. In retrospect, we said, no, we'll look at the situation, we'll evaluate, and we'll make a decision on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Also, I talked emp about empowering staff. We empowered uh, the buildings to decide what time the med line should be, uh, because they knew best. And they were, no, you can't, no, we can't do that, we can't do that. You know what? You guys know, you come up with the time. Well, they came up with seven o'clock at night which turned out medically not to be a good time because of the reactions of people. They weren't able to sleep. There was some agitation and some other things. So again, we learned the lesson. Yes, flexibility, but education first so the decisions that folks make don't interfere uh, and then don't look like, hey, we told you you could do it when you want to, and now you're telling us 
uh, uh, you can't. There wasn't enough communication between the different buildings. We have six different buildings where we administer MAT. So ultimately, Dr. Clark, myself, and our substance abuse coordinator went to each building and spent time with staff. And that worked really great uh, in the buildings where the people knew us and respected us. Dr. Clark had been a doctor with us for many years and worked primarily in the women's facility. So when we went to the women's facility, they trusted her, they accepted her, they believed in what she said, and they really jumped on board. Then the next day we went to maximum security and we had quite a different experience because they really didn't work with her, they didn't really know her, they didn't trust her. Uh, so one lesson we learned there is when you go to a building, you need to bring some champions uh, that the staff know and respect. And that might be a lieutenant, uh, it might be a deputy warden. It really doesn't matter what title the person has, but it's just someone that they respect and trust, that if they say, hey, this program is okay, this is really a good thing, uh, uh, you, you, we'll, we'll, we'll get by in. We fail to make housing officers our partners. Now, the housing officers, they, they know everything, right? They see these guys almost 24 hours a day. So they were observing things like guys were nodding off, guys were sleeping, guys acted like they were high, and they complained to each other about it and how horrible this program is, but they le never let medical know what was going on. So we learned that we have to train, meet with, and get together with housing officers and let them know what an important role they play in this program and that we're interested in what they're observing and what they're say, seeing, and please let us know so that we could adjust the medication and make the program work. And once we did that, the complaining stopped, and they really were very helpful and useful uh, in the information uh, they provided. There were communication gaps between the providers uh, and the security staff. For example, we had an inmate that had diverted a couple of times. It got to the point that security was fed up. Like, hey, they've done this like three times already and nothing's happened to him. Like nothing was even said to him. Well, what they didn't realize is that medical didn't even know that they had diverted because we didn't have a mechanism for communicating that information from security to medical. Obviously, we then put together a protocol so that now, um, now, now we do that. Frequent meetings are necessary with all the different players. Uh, it's not easy, it's time consuming, but it's, it's, it's necessary. Um, we listen to security, like even the type of medication. In some buildings we started with pills, and then we went to strips, and then we went to crush pills. So different things work in different buildings, and the way you know what to do is you have to really listen and pay close attention to staff. Uh, staff, everyone's going to hear about the failures. When something goes wrong, somehow everybody knows by the next morning. Uh, the successes, not so much. People really don't hear about it. So uh, as managers, supervisors, leaders, we try to uh, share the successes, make sure people know. We bring folks back into the facilities that have been through the program and are now living in the community and being successful. A few years ago, we didn't let these people back. These are, these are criminals, these are inmates. They're not coming back into my building. Uh, the philosophy has changed. We learned they're very effective. We say, you know, we have khaki uniforms. The folks that wear the khakis have a big influence on some of the other folks, a lot more than those of us that wear suit and ties and, and, and come into the program. Um, and then, you know, even when do you dose? We had a problem with security that folks were arrested, a lot of folks get arrested over the weekend, like I'm sure in your place. Uh, and then Monday morning, we ship them off to court. They were refusing to go to court. It's like, huh? And then we learned we really can't force them to go to court. And I don't know if, you, if you're able to force them. But what was it? People were coming in over the weekend. They were getting dope sick. They knew that on Monday afternoon, uh, the Kodak, the clinicians were coming in, would do an assessment, and if appropriate, they would be given medication. So they rather miss court and get in trouble, but they felt so bad they just wanted to feel better. So again, we learned from that experience, and we started getting Kodak in early Monday morning before the uh, run uh, to court. People got a dose, they were stabilized, they went to court, and you know, it worked fine. So little things like that you have to tweak uh, as, as, as you learn. 
a misnomer before MAT. People thought, you know, we detox people, but then they were cured. You heard yesterday, right, they, there's, there's a cool study about cigarettes. We heard about 70-something percent of, of our inmates were smokers when they came in. Uh, when they leave, about 93 percent are smokers. Do you know how long it takes, on average, for those folks to have their first cigarette after release? Yeah, an hour. An hour. Right? So that goes, because again, a lot of us think, well, if you're clean and sober for a long time, why the heck are we putting these folks back on medication? Like, this is the craziest thing I ever heard. Well, that's why statistics, you know, statistics show. Um, so don't, don't oversell the program. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't always work. Technical assistance is available to support the evidence-based prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorder. To request technical assistance, visit opioidresponsenetwork.org.